welcome to the Hebraic Heritage Ministries Yeshiva Discipleship Program. In this session, we are going to be discussing the subject of the patterns of exile and redemption in the prophets. In the previous sessions, we looked at the pattern of exile and redemption in the Torah. And this is going to begin our studies looking at the issue from the prophets. What we learned from the Torah is that beginning with the covenant that was made with Abraham, then Isaac, and Jacob, that Abraham was told of the God of Israel in Genesis chapter 15, that his descendants would go into Egypt and that ultimately the God of Israel would redeem them from Egypt. This redemption from Egypt is a foreshadowing of the ultimate end of the exile of the house of Jacob from all the nations where they've been scattered in the end of days at the dawn of the Messianic era. And the Bible tells us that this will take place during a period of time known as Jacob's trouble. The Torah commands the people of the God of Israel that they are to remember always the historical Egyptian redemption. In Exodus chapter 13, verses 8 and 9, it is written, And you shall show your son in that day, speaking of future generations, saying, This is done, that is the celebration of Passover, because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. And it, the coming forth out of Egypt, shall be for a sign upon your hand and a memorial between your eyes, that the Lord's Torah may be in your mouth, for with a strong hand has the Lord brought you out of Egypt. Egypt. In the commentary on the Torah by Moses Nachmanides or the Ramban to Exodus on page 168, commenting about this commandment, he writes, the verse is saying that you should make the Exodus from Egypt a sign upon your hand and between your eyes a source for discourse distilling as the dew upon those that hear it. Now, the fundamental reason of this commandment is that we lay the script of the exodus from Egypt upon the hand and upon the head. On page 169 to his commentary to the Torah of Genesis, Nachmanides goes on to write regarding this commandment, Thus we are to inscribe on parchment, the scriptural sections of Kodesh sanctify unto me, which is Exodus chapter 13, verses 1 through 10, and Vaheya ki yavikia, and it shall be when the Lord shall bring you, verses 11 through 16 of Exodus chapter 13, and enclose them in the phylacteries because of this commandment wherein we were charged to make the Exodus from Egypt for frontlet between our eyes. We are also to inscribe and enclose in the phylacteries the sections of the Shema, Hero Israel, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, and also Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 through 21. It will come to pass if you shall hearken, because we are charged to have the commandments of the Torah also for frontlets between our eyes, as it is written. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. This is why we also inscribe on parchment these two sections, the Shema and Ve Im Shamoa, for frontlets, even though the Exodus is not mentioned in them. For they contain the commandments of the unity of God, the memorial of all commandments, the doctrine of retribution, which states that the consequences of disobeying the commandment is punishment, and that the blessings come in the wake of obedience which forms the whole foundation of our faith. This principle of remembering the historical Egyptian redemption as it relates to the ingathering of the exiles in the end of days, Paul mentioned 
and also stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4 and verse 11, as it is written, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. Don't be ignorant that all our fathers were under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. And they were all immersed under Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Don't be ignorant about the historical Egyptian redemption that if you are a believer in the God of Israel, not only you, but all believers in the God of Israel did he redeem out of Egypt. And did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Messiah. So, five times it is mentioned here that all of our fathers were under the cloud. They all passed through the sea. They were all immersed into Moses, in the cloud, and in the sea. They all did eat the same spiritual meat. They all did drink the same spiritual drink. Now, verse 11 tells us why we are to identify with the historical Egyptian redemption. Paul writes, Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, a type or a shadow, but they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come, or those who would be living in the generation to see the coming of Yeshua and what precedes his feet setting down on the Mount of Olives is the ingathering of the exiles during the tribulation period. In Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 15 we are told here that exile is a consequence for breaking the commandments given at Mount Sinai, as it is written. But it will come to pass, if you will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God, to observe to do all these commandments and these statutes which I command you this day, that all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. And in describing the curses, ultimately, one of the curses is exile into the nations. Verse 64, And the Lord will scatter you among all people from one end of the earth even unto the other. In the Sanchino Midrash Rabbah, volume 5, page 244, it also speaks of the fact that exile comes about from breaking the Torah. What is meant by, Now therefore, O ye children, hearken unto me, Scripture is speaking of the ten tribes on the one hand and of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin on the other. For all Israel are called children, as it says in Deuteronomy in chapter 14, verse 1. You are the children of the Lord your God. Hearken unto me. Scripture exhorts them to fulfill their duty of hearkening to the commandments or to the Torah. And depart not from the words of my mouth. He exhorts them to keep their promise of doing them as they had undertaken at Sinai. All that the Lord has spoken we will do and hearken. Exodus chapter 24 verse 7. For they were exiled on account of having transgressed both of these things. In Deuteronomy in chapter 30 verses 1 through 5 we are given the promise of gathering the exiles of the house of Jacob from all the places where they have been scattered. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1 through verse 5, it is written, It will come to pass when all these things are come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before you, and you shall call them to mind among all the nations whither the Lord your God has driven you. And you shall return, that is shuv, repent, under the Lord your God, and shall obey his voice, meaning following Torah, according to all that I command you this day, that is the word spoken at Mount Sinai, you and your children with all your heart and with all your soul, that then the Lord your God will turn your captivity and have compassion upon you and will return and gather you from all the nations whither the Lord your God has scattered you. And if any of you be driven out under the utmost parts of heaven, from there will the Lord your God gather you, and from there will he fetch you. 
And the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed. That is the land of Israel. And you will possess it. And he will do you good and multiply you above your fathers. What period of time are we talking about when you return to the land and he's going to do you good and you will have it better than your fathers? This is referring to the Messianic era. This is referring to the promise of the ingathering that is associated with the Messianic era. In the book, The Messianic Idea in Israel by Joseph Klausner on page 33, he comments on these verses from Deuteronomy in chapter 30, which we've just read. He says, The idea of the return to Zion, that is the hope of redemption and faith in the return of the natives or the exiles to their own country, that is the land of Israel, is the cornerstone of the messianic ideal and it's found here almost in its entirety. In the book, I Await His Coming Every Day by Rabbi Menachem Schneerson, on page 14, he is making a reference to Mishnah Torah written by Moses Maimonides or the Rambam where he writes about the laws of the kings and the laws concerning the coming of the Messiah. In chapter 11 of Mishnah Torah, Laws of the Kings, the laws concerning the coming of the Messiah, Maimonides writes, In future time, the King Messiah will arise and renew the Davidic dynasty, restoring it to its initial sovereignty. He will rebuild the temple and gather in the dispersed remnant of Israel. He goes on to say that whoever does not believe in him or does not await his coming denies not only the statements of the prophets, but also those of the Torah and of Moses, our teacher. For the Torah attests to his coming. That is the Messiah in the ingathering of the exiles, stating, and now he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 30. And the Lord your God will bring back your captivity and have compassion upon you. He will return and gather you from all the nations, even if your dispersed ones are in the furthest reaches of the heavens. From there will God gather you in, and God will bring you to the land. These explicit words of the Torah include all that was said on the subject by all the prophets. Let's now look at the cycle of exile and redemption. It begins by the breaking of the covenant, that is not following Torah, and the commandments that were given at Mount Sinai. Number two, the punishment for not following Torah is exile into the nations. Number three, in being exiled in the nations, the nation of Israel experiences bondage by their captors, which brings about a yearning for repentance. And repentance brings about the redemption, and it's the Messiah who gathers the exiles of Israel. In the book, The Messianic Idea in Israel by Joseph Klausner, page 58, he comments regarding the book of Isaiah, highlighting that Isaiah speaks about the leaders of Judah being corrupt. And this is the part of the process that leads to punishment. He writes, Regarding the messianic chain of events, it goes like this. Sin causes punishment. Punishment causes repentance. And repentance brings in its wake redemption. And redemption is in store for the righteous. That is, those who repent, confess their sins, and seek to follow Torah and are redeemed by the Messiah. The princes of Judah are referred to in their corruption in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 10 as rulers of Sodom and people of Gomorrah. In Isaiah 1:23 it is said of them, they do not protect the rights of the weak, they do not defend the cause of the orphan and the widow. In Isaiah chapter 1 verses 11 through 15 They are referred to as a companion of thieves, loving bribes, and pursuing rewards. The hands of the people are full of blood. Therefore, even their prayer is an abomination, and their offerings and feasts are burdensome. 
in the Messianic Idea in Israel by Joseph Klausner, page 91, he further highlights from the book of Jeremiah the sins of the house of Judah or the southern kingdom. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 19, it is written, Your own wickedness shall correct you, and your backsliding shall reprove you. Know therefore and see that it is an evil and a bitter thing. You have forsaken the Lord your God. Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 19 says, And it will come to pass when you shall say, Wherefore has the Lord our God done all these things unto us? Then you shall say unto them, Like as you have forsaken me and served strange gods in your land, so shall you serve strangers in a land that is not yours. That is exile. In Jeremiah chapter 2 verses 20 through 23, in Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 18, and similar verses, it speaks about the people forsaking the Lord and going after Baal, and especially after the Assyrian Babylonian deities of Shamash, which is the sun god, and Ishtar. In Jeremiah 2 verse 8, it says, The heads of the leaders of the people are no better than the rest. The priests said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handle the Torah knew me not. They're not teaching Torah. And the rulers transgressed against me, the prophets also prophesied by Baal. In the Messianic Idea in Israel by Joseph Klausner, pages 91 and 92, in giving an outline of what is said in the book of Jeremiah, which speaks of the sins of the house of Judah or the southern kingdom, Klausner writes, King Jehoiakim, who turned aside from the Lord, built his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by injustice. And he uses his neighbor's services without wages and gives him not his hire. This is Jeremiah chapter 22 verse 13. The blood of the innocent poor can be found in Judah, not in a hidden place, but out in the open in every street. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 34. The princes of Judah do not please the cause of the orphan nor defend the rights of the needy. Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 28. And the common people of Judah belie the Lord saying, It is not he, neither shall evil come upon us, neither shall we see sword nor famine. Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 12. Therefore they refuse to receive discipline and are unwilling to turn about in complete repentance. Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 3. Shall the Lord not punish for these things and shall not his soul be avenged on such a nation as this? Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 9. Then punishment comes, says the prophet. Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 25. Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good from you. And as a result, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 15, the Lord will scatter the sons of his people among nations whom they and their fathers have not known, and he will send the sword after them till they be devoured. Amos speaks about moral corruption that is happening in the northern kingdom, known as Ephraim, or the house of Israel. In the Messianic Idea in Israel, Joseph Klausner on page 38 writes, Moral corruption was rife among the people, especially in the kingdom of Israel. But the final outcome of the punishment and afflictions would be repentance and salvation. The cycle goes like this. Sin brings punishment. Punishment brings repentance which in turn brings about the days of the Messiah. The period of affliction and punishment, the great period of affliction and punishment, the highlight of the period of affliction and punishment, spoken about by Amos, is a period of time known as the day of the Lord or that day. Amos also speaks about the condition that which would entail at this time is that the Torah would not be followed and would be forgotten. The Messianic idea in Israel, on page 41, it says, The prophet numbers also the cessation of prophecy or the Torah being forgotten by Israel. Amos chapter 8. 
verses 11 and 12. Behold, the days come, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro and seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. On these two verses are based the belief that the Torah is destined to be forgotten by Israel. The whole outline of the period which must come before the advent of the Messiah follows and the characteristics are as follows. Exile, destruction, slaughter, humiliation, changes in the order of nation and the cessation of following the Torah. In outlining the sins of Judah and Israel which causes punishment is that the leaders of the people are corrupt. They accept bribes. They shed innocent blood, etc. They do not protect the rights of the weak, that is the poor, the widow, the orphan. They worship other gods, Baal and Ishtar. And the prophets prophesied by Baal and the Torah is forgotten. Sin then causes punishment. In the Messianic Idea in Israel by Joseph Klausner on page 122, he outlines the punishment that is spoken about in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel writes that Judah has sinned more than Sodom and Gomorrah. And the punishment will not be less than the sin. The Lord will do in Israel what he has not done up to now and he will never do again. Ezekiel chapter 5 verse 9. He will judge them by sword and by pestilence and by famine. And the ultimate punishment is exile and dispersion in various nations. Ezekiel chapter 5 verses 10 through 17 describes that these kinds of punishment will come as a penalty for the above dreadful abominations. However, with the penalties and the punishment, will ultimately come refining and purification. It's said in Ezekiel chapter 22, verses 18 through 22, As silver is smelted in the midst of a furnace, so will the people be smelted in the midst of Jerusalem by the slayings, the distresses, and the destruction, in order that the few or the remnant who emerge from the furnace safely may be refined by silver." Looking at this, we have outlined how that sin causes punishment. And the God of Israel will judge his people with sword, pestilence, famine, and exile. Next in the cycle is that repentance happens and repentance precedes redemption. From Jeremiah in chapter 3, Klausner outlines in the Messianic Idea in Israel, page 94... No other prophet emphasized the value of repentance for the whole nation as did Jeremiah, where he writes in Jeremiah chapter 3, Return, thou backsliding Israel, says the Lord, and I will not frown upon you. For I am merciful, says the Lord, I will not bear grudge forever. And if you will put away your detestable things out of my sight and will not waver, O Jerusalem, wash your heart from wickedness, that you may be saved, as it's written in Jeremiah in chapter 4. In Jeremiah chapter 3, Klausner comments in the Messianic Idea in Israel, page 96, Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am a Lord unto you, and I will take you one of the city and two of a family and bring you to Zion. And I will give you shepherds according to my heart, who shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it will come to pass when you are multiplied and increased in the land in those days, says the Lord, that they shall say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they make mention of it, neither shall they miss it, neither shall it be made any more. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the stubbornness of their evil heart. In those days the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. In these few verses we see the mentioning of repentance, And following repentance is the ingathering of the exiles and the concentration of the nation in Zion.
in Isaiah chapter 11, Klausner on page 63 of his book, The Messianic Idea in Israel, also shows us of the promise of the ingathering of the exiles. The ingathering of the exiles will take place at the time of redemption. From Ethiopia, Elam, Hamath, and the islands of the Mediterranean Sea, the Lord will gather the remnant of his people, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11. He will set up an end sign for the nations. When he gathers his people in the end of days, it's a sign to the nations. He will assemble the dispersed of Israel and gather together the scattered of Judah from the four corners of the earth, Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 12. Like Hosea in Hosea chapter 2, Isaiah also likens the expected redemption to the Egyptian exile, Isaiah chapter 11 verses 15 and 16. At this time, Judah and Ephraim will be united and they will make peace between themselves. Isaiah in chapter 11 and verse 13. This is also mentioned as Klausner points out in his book on page 183 in Isaiah in chapter 27 which says that the ingathering of the exiles will also take place at the time of redemption. The children of Israel will be gathered one by one from all the lands in which they were then scattered, from the Euphrates to the river of Egypt. And it will come to pass in that day that a great horn shall be blown, and they shall come that were lost in the land of Assyria, and they that were dispersed in the land of Egypt, and they shall worship the Lord in the holy mountain at Jerusalem. Isaiah 27 and verse 13. Klausner also describes how Jeremiah speaks of the end gathering of the exiles in his book, The Messianic Idea in Israel, on page 95, where he writes, At the beginning of the redemption, there will be an end gathering of the exiles. I have already referred to the words of the prophet that the Lord will gather the remnant of his people as the grape cutter gathers up the grapes fallen from the vine. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 9. The house of Judah will be brought out from among the nations to whose lands they were banished and will be led back to Zion. Jeremiah chapter 12 verse 14, 23 verse 3, 29 verse 14, 30 verse 3, 32 verse 37, 46 verse 27. And Ephraim will also be redeemed at that time. Klausner on page 96 of his book, refers to the end gathering the exile spoken of by Jeremiah in chapter 31 where it says Rachel is weeping for her children these are the Ephraimites who will receive answer from the Lord that their children will return to their own border Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 15 through 17 the Lord will have compassion on his darling son Ephraim and become a father to Israel since Ephraim is his firstborn, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 9 and verse 20. The sons of Ephraim will join with the sons of Judah, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 6, which says, There shall be a day that the watchman shall call upon the Mount Ephraim, saying, Arise and let us go up to Zion unto the Lord our God. For at the time of redemption, the Lord will be the God of all the families of Israel. Jeremiah in chapter 31 and verse 1. Klausner comments on page 42 of the Messianic Idea in Israel regarding Amos chapter 9 and where Amos chapter 9 refers to the ingathering of the exiles. He writes, All the exiles and captives will return from the lands of their captivity. For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all the nations. Like as corn is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the ground. Amos chapter 9 verse 9. Then the prophet adds, In that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is falling. Continuing on page 43, And close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. Amos chapter 9 verse 11. The kingdom of the house of David therefore will be restored to its former glory and the kings of the house of David will rule also over the ten tribes. In the Torah anthology, the book of the twelve prophets, 
volume 1, page 456, commenting about Amos chapter 9, verse 11. It is written, Amos speaks prophetically about the redemption. God will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen. This refers to the calamity of the kingdom splitting in two in the days of Jeroboam, 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 13, as of then and until the time of Hosea, son of Elah, 2 Kings chapter 17, the kingdom of the house of David was fallen. In Zephaniah chapter 3 in the book, The Messianic Idea in Israel by Joseph Klausner, page 86, he writes about how Zephaniah chapter 3 speaks about the ingathering of the exiles. It is self-evident that there will be an ingathering of the exiles at that time. Even those widely dispersed and far removed from Israel will be gathered to their own land, and these ingathered ones will be a name and a praise among all the peoples of the earth. Zephaniah chapter 3 verses 19 and 20. Even the peoples from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia will bring him an offering. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 10, which is similar to what is stated in Isaiah chapter 18 and verses 1 through 3. Klausner comments on page 48 of his book, The Messianic Idea in Israel, how it's stated in Hosea chapter 2 regarding the ingathering of the exiles that the future redemption is like the historical Egyptian redemption. Hosea prophesies that the future redemption will be like the redemption from the Egyptian bondage. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly unto her. And I will give her her vineyards from there in the valley of Achor. And Achor means trouble or troubling. The valley of Achor, that is the valley of trouble, which is an allusion to the tribulation period. And the tribulation period will be a door of hope. What is the hope? The hope is the ingathering of the exiles. And she shall respond there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. On page 74 of the Messianic Idea in Israel, Klausner comments regarding Micah chapter 7 that is also stated there that the future redemption is like the historical Egyptian redemption. For like Hosea, Micah stresses the great similarity between the expected redemption and the exodus from Egypt in the time of Moses. As in the days of your coming forth out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things says the prophet in Micah chapter 7 verse 15. The hope of redemption was influenced by the old tradition which Israel had concerning the Egyptian exile and the deliverance from this exile and that the belief in the Messiah was brought into being by the early portrayal possessed by Israel of the gigantic figure of Moses who was regarded as the first redeemer and the savior of Israel according to the rabbis of the Talmud. In the Torah Anthology of the Book of the Twelve Prophets, Volume 2, page 107, speaking about Micah chapter 7, verse 15, it says, As in the days of your coming out of the land of Egypt, I will show him wondrous things. What happened at the Exodus is an indication of what will happen in the coming future. In the book entitled Torah Studies by Rabbi Menachem Schneerson on page 96, he also repeats this understanding that the future redemption is like the historical Egyptian redemption. Like the days of your exodus from the land of Egypt, I will demonstrate wonders. This means that the future redemption will parallel the redemption of the past. In The Messianic Idea in Israel by Joseph Klausner on page 97, he explains that this principle that the future redemption is like the historical Egyptian redemption is spoken of by Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 16. The union of the sons of Judah with the sons of Israel is spoken of. Every one of these Messianic ideas is set forth in any number of places in Jeremiah at great length. We have already seen this with regard to repentance, the ingathering of the exiles, and the union of Judah and Israel. Twice, Jeremiah emphasizes the similarity between the redemption to come and the first redemption, the deliverance from Egypt, 
a similarity which I emphasized in chapter 2 of the book, having found it a number of times in the words of almost all the prophets. Quoting from Jeremiah chapter 16, verses 14 and 15, in Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 7 and 8, he writes, Therefore, behold, the days come, says the Lord, that will no more be said, as the Lord lives that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the countries where he has driven them, and I will bring them back into their land that I gave to their fathers. On page 239 of the Messianic Idea in Israel, Klausner writes that the ingathering of the exiles as spoken of by the prophets is northern kingdom and southern kingdom united, Ephraim and Judah united. This remnant of Israel will be left from the sons of Judah and the sons of Ephraim alike. The union of Judah and Ephraim is something that is prophesied by almost all the prophets from Amos to Ezekiel, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, Micah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel all speak of this as well as Zechariah who expects the redemption and the strengthening of Judah and Ephraim. Zechariah chapter 10 verses 6 to 12 and the rule of one king over both. Zechariah chapter 9 verses 9 and 10. There will be, in the time of redemption and in gathering of exiles, which is already alluded to in the book of Deuteronomy, which we mentioned earlier, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 5, and which is expected by almost all the prophets, once again, including Amos, Hosea, 1st and 2nd Isaiah, they divided Isaiah into two parts. We have one book of Hosea. Micah, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, Obadiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Joel, and the Psalms. What is this pattern of redemption? Repentance precedes redemption. The exiles will return to the land of Israel. The future redemption will be like the historical Egyptian redemption, And northern kingdom and southern kingdom, or Ephraim and Judah, will be united. In the book, The Messianic Idea in Israel by Joseph Klausner, on page 171, commenting from the book of Isaiah, he makes mention that the Messiah is going to come to those who repent from their sin. The cycle is, sin causes punishment, And repentance brings about the redemption. But a redeemer will only come unto those that turn from transgression in Jacob. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 20. The Lord will not redeem everyone that is called by his name, as Isaiah promised in the period of his first enthusiasm as to the possibility of the return to Zion, but only everyone who makes repentance. The rest will be delivered over to the sword and brought down to slaughter. Isaiah 65 verse 12, Isaiah 66 verse 4, and verses 14 through 17. Only a limited number or a remnant will be saved by virtue of the fact that they observed justice and did righteousness. By this they will have brought redemption and salvation near. But those who are saved will be all of them righteous, and they shall inherit the land forever. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 21. In the Messianic Idea in Israel by Joseph Klausner, page 47 and 48, commenting regarding Hosea chapter 1, he makes mention that it is the Messiah who gathers the exiles of Israel. Hosea speaks in clear terms of an individual Messiah. And the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and they shall appoint themselves one head and they shall go up out of the land for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Hosea in chapter 1 verses 10 and 11. But from these verses we can see clearly that the prophet means when he speaks of the day of Jezreel as the day of redemption, since it will come after the ingathering of the exiles. The one head 
with the children of Israel will appoint in order to go up from the land of their exile must be without doubt a strong redeemer, a personal Messiah. In the Torah anthology of the book of the Twelve Prophets, volume 1, page 29 and 30, speaking of these verses of Hosea, it is written, and the comment is made, the children of Judah and the children of Israel will be gathered together. It was different when the exiles returned from Babylon to build the second temple. Only those from the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin had been exiled to Babylon, and some of them returned. The other tribes were exiled earlier to other locations, and they never returned. The scripture refers to the children of Judah who had been exiled in the days of Nebuchadnezzar. Not all of them returned in the days of Ezra, but in the future they and the children of Israel, meaning the ten tribes, together will appoint over them one head. This refers to the anointed Messiah known as the Messiah, son of Joseph, or the suffering Messiah. Klausner, in page 74 of the Messianic Idea, also shows from Micah in chapter 2 of the understanding that the Messiah would gather the exiles of Israel. When the Lord again has mercy upon his people, the Lord will assemble all of Jacob or Judah and also collect the remnant of Israel. Then the lands of Judah and Israel will give forth a great noise because of the multitude of people, as does a pasture field filled with the flocks of sheep and goats. Micah chapter 2 verse 12. The Lord will also gather in the banished, the dispersed, and the oppressed of his people, just as a shepherd gathers in the limping, the straying, and the castaway sheep. He will make the dispersed of Israel into a strong nation, and he himself will rule over them on Mount Zion from henceforth even forever. Micah chapter 4 verses 6 and 7. But they will also have a king, the King Messiah. The king will pass on before them with the Lord at their head. Micah chapter 2 and verse 13. We see in the Brit Tadashah, the renewed covenant, that Messiah says he's the good shepherd who gathers the exiles of Israel. John chapter 10 verse 14, Yeshua says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. And he is referring to the prophecy from Ezekiel chapter 34 verses 11 and 13 that Yahweh Elohim, who is the good shepherd, will seek and search out his sheep and he will gather the exiles of Israel and bring them back to the land of Israel, as it is written. For thus says Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out, and I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel, that's Judea and Samaria, by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. When Yeshua stated that he's the good shepherd in John chapter 10 verse 14, he went on to state in John chapter 10 verses 16 and 17 that being a good shepherd, he's going to lay down his life for his sheep so that he ultimately will be able to gather his sheep, the exiles of Israel, Ephraim and Judah. Speaking to Jews, in John chapter 10, Yeshua says, Other sheep I have. He did not say, I will have after I die on the tree. He says, I have, which means at the moment he's speaking these words, he's claiming ownership of this other sheepfold. He's speaking to Jews. Who's the other sheepfold? It's the northern kingdom or Ephraim, which are not of this fold, meaning that they're not of the southern kingdom or the house of Judah. He says, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. He's saying that those who would believe and accept that he's the Messiah would be those from the northern kingdom primarily. There's always been a remnant of believers of the house of Judah as well in every generation. And when he brings back and when the northern kingdom believes that he's the Messiah, there will ultimately then be a reunification of Ephraim and Judah because Yeshua said there will be one fold, 
That's reunification with Ephraim and Judah. And one shepherd. He's the one shepherd that will be over the exiles of Israel who are regathered. And in order for this to be accomplished, he had to forgive them of their sins, which he does by dying on the tree if they would accept his redemptive work for the forgiveness of their sins. And thus he says, therefore, because there'll be one fold and one shepherd, therefore does my father love me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. In John chapter 11, verses 49 through 52, it is also stated that Yeshua died on the tree to gather the exiles of Israel, as it is written. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all, nor consider that is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, Caiaphas prophesied that Yeshua would die for that nation. Who is the nation that Caiaphas is prophesying that Yeshua would die for? The house of Judah. But then John chapter 11 verse 52 says, and not for that nation only. So he's dying for Judah, but he's also dying for another nation. That is Ephraim, both houses of Israel. How do we know that he's speaking of both houses of Israel? Because it says that he would gather together in one, two nations, two kingdoms, who would be gathered as one, that's Ephraim and Judah, who are called the children of God scattered abroad. At the time that Yeshua dies on the tree, who are the children of God scattered abroad? That are two nations. It's Ephraim and Judah. Yeshua is stating that he's dying on the tree to gather the exiles of Israel. Now the fullness of this time of punishment is known as the day of the Lord. Specifically, it's the tribulation period or Jacob's trouble of the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord also entails the period of time when Yeshua sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives and he rules and reigns and sets up a government and makes Torah disciples of all nations. In the book, The Messianic Idea in Israel by Joseph Klosner, on page 237, speaking about that sin brings about the punishment of the God of Israel, he says, without sin, there is no place for the idea of redemption. And the major time of punishment is referred to as the day of the Lord, or also referred to as the day of judgment. In The Messianic Idea in Israel by Joseph Klausner, page 238, he writes that Elijah will precede the day of the Lord from what is mentioned in the book of Malachi. Malachi adds that before the day of the Lord, the prophet Elijah will come and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers. If we are living in the prophesied events of the day of the Lord, which I believe we are, and we're told that Elijah precedes the day of the Lord, then Elijah must be present at this hour. In what form or fashion is Elijah present? If the message of Elijah is remember the Torah of Moses, we formally call it the Hebraic Roots of Christianity movement, and the voice of this movement is, in believing that Yeshua is the Messiah, we need to express that faith in him by keeping his commandments or following Torah. And this movement has preceded the event that we're going to see that takes place in the period of time known as the day of the Lord. The ministry of Elijah is a ministry of restoration. Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Remember ye the Torah of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming and great and dreadful day of the Lord. So the message of Elijah before the day of the Lord is to remember the Torah of Moses. And this is personified today in the voice, in the message of the Hebraic Roots of Christianity movement. 
the birth pains or the tribulation precede the coming of King Messiah. Klausner makes mention of this understanding in his book, The Messianic Idea in Israel, on page 48. Israel must endure the pains of a woman in childbirth before the advent of the Messiah. This expression is found in Hosea chapter 13, verse 13, and it brought about the Talmudic expression, the birth pangs of the Messiah. In Isaiah in chapter 13, we are told how the day of the Lord is linked with the birth pangs of the Messiah. Klausner explains this in his book, The Messianic Idea in Israel, on page 178. The day of the Lord, or the day of judgment, or the day of punishment, is described in this burden in brilliant colors, unique and kind. The day of the Lord will come suddenly as destruction from the Almighty, Isaiah 13, verse 6. Therefore, all hands will be slack and every heart will melt, Isaiah 13, verse 7. All will be frightened and the pains of childbirth shall seize them, Isaiah 13, verse 8. From this came at a later time the term, the birth pangs of the Messiah. The day of the Lord is linked with the birth pains of the Messiah, as Klausner also explains in his book, The Messianic Idea in Israel, on page 237, where he writes, The events of the day of judgment, or the tribulation, or the birth pains of the Messiah, we find the following things. Frightful wars, destruction, exile, humiliation, and changes for the worse in the order of nature. Amos also adds the forgetting of the word of the Lord, or in the later Hebrew language, the cessation of Torah. All these elements were afterward included in the event that are associated with the birth pangs of the Messiah. Let's look how the day of the Lord is associated with Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah chapter 30 verses 6 and 7 as it is written. Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail and all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great. What day? The time of a woman being in travail. That day is great. Or the day of the Lord. So that none is like it. It is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he will be saved, delivered, or redeemed out of it or through it. In the day of the Lord, we're told in Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 4, that Gaza would be forsaken. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day, that is the day of the Lord, is a day of wrath. That day is a day of trouble, Jacob's trouble. It's a time of distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. For Gaza shall be forsaken, and Ashkelon a desolation. They shall drive out Ashdod at the noonday, and Ekron shall be rooted up. In the day of the Lord, we're told in the book of Joel, that the land of Israel will be divided. Joel chapter 1 verse 15, Joel chapter 3 verse 2. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as destruction from the Almighty shall it come. That day, the day of the Lord, the nations will divide the land of Israel. I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat means Yahweh judges. And I will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they've scattered among the nations and parted or divided my land. Israel and Judah will return to the land of Israel during Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 3 and verses 6 and 7, it is written, for lo, the days come, says the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, 
says the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. So the subject of Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 3 is that Israel and Judah will return to the land. And speaking about Israel and Judah returning to the land, in Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 6 it says it's the time of travail, and Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 7 says it's the time of Jacob's trouble. Israel and Judah return back to the land of Israel during Jacob's trouble. The day of the Lord is a time of judgment upon the nations. The judgment is for dividing the land. Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 7 and verse 11 it is written, Alas, for that day is great. That is the day of the Lord or Jacob's trouble. So that none is like it. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, but Jacob will be saved, delivered, or redeemed out of it. And now we see the connection of Jacob's trouble to the judgment of the nations. Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 11. For I am with you, says the Lord, to save you, though I make a full end of all nations where I have scattered you. He's judging the nations. He's making a full end of the nations where his people have been scattered, but he's delivering his people. In the book, The Messianic Idea in Israel by Joseph Klausner on page 94, he also explains that the day of the Lord is a time of judgment upon the nations. Also, after the fearful prophecy that a nation from afar will carry out slaughter, pillage, and destruction in Judah, the prophet concludes, But even in those days, says the Lord, I will not make a full end of you. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 18. Twice. The prophet repeats these forceful words, For I will make a full end of all the nations whither I have scattered you, but I will not make a full end of you. Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 11, Jeremiah chapter 46 and verse 28. In the Sanchino Midrash Rabbah, volume 5, page 340, we can also see how the day of the Lord is associated with the judgment of the nations. Who cries, woe, who, alas, etc. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 29. Although Israel had sinned, and the Holy One, blessed be he, had delivered them into the hands of the nations of the world on account of their sins, yet the latter also were not to escape scot-free, for in the end the Holy One, blessed be he, judged the nations of the world into whose hands he had delivered them, just as he had done in Egypt and in Babylon. This is the reason why who is written six times, in allusion to the six times which Israel were exiled among the nations of whom all were punished on their account. They are as follows, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media, Greece, and the Roman Empire, who was referred to by the rabbis as Edom. Accordingly, it says, And I am very sore displeased with the nations that are at ease, for I was but a little displeased, and they helped for evil. Zechariah chapter 1, verse 15. And for I will make a full end of all the nations where I have driven you. Jeremiah in chapter 46 and verse 28. In the Sanchino, Midrash Rabbah, volume 5, page 341, it goes on to say, All that devour him shall be held guilty. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 3. So will he destroy them, that is the nations, out of the world for the iniquity of doing evil to Israel. As it says in Joel chapter 4, verse 19. This is in a Jewish published Bible. So will he destroy them that is the nations, out of the world for the iniquity of doing evil to Israel, as it says, Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness, for the violence against the children of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood. In the Torah Anthology to the Twelve Prophets, Volume 2, page 253 and 254, it explains that the day of the Lord is the time that the nations are judged for afflicting Israel. Behold, at that time I will deal with all those who afflicted you, and I will bring deliverance to her who limps and assemble her who was driven afar. Behold, at that time refers to the final redemption. I will at that time deal with all those who afflicted you. In the book, The Messianic Idea in Israel, 
by Joseph Klausner on page 204. He explains that the day of the Lord is a time when all the nations are gathered against Jerusalem, which is spoken about in Zechariah chapter 12 and Zechariah in chapter 14. However, along with Ezekiel, Zechariah envisions the war of the Gentiles against Jerusalem, which will come after Israel is settled peacefully in its own land. This war is described by Zechariah in chapters 12 and 14. All the peoples will be gathered together against Jerusalem and Judah. In Zechariah chapter 14, verse 12, it says, The judgment for fighting against Jerusalem and for dividing Jerusalem is nuclear warfare. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will spite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongues shall consume away in their mouth. In The Messianic Idea in Israel by Joseph Klausner, page 179, he explains how the in-gathering of the exiles is linked or associated with the fall of Babylon. He writes, The outline of the Messianic expectations includes this thought, that the redemption of Israel is mentioned as being bound up with the fall of of Babylon. In Jeremiah chapter 50 verse 4 and in Jeremiah chapter 50 and 51 it describes the judgment upon Babylon and in Jeremiah chapter 50 verse 4 it says that when Babylon falls that the children of Israel and the children of Judah will be leaving Babylon and returning back to the land of Israel or Zion. This is a reference to the Bible-believing Jews and the Bible-believing Christians who will be fleeing Babylon when it's judged and returning back to the land of Israel. In those days and in that time, says the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, they and the children of Judah together, going and weeping. They shall go and they shall seek the Lord their God. They shall ask the way to Zion with their faces thitherward saying come and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that will not be forgotten. What is this perpetual covenant that will not be forgotten? It's the covenant of peace of the Messianic era when Messiah sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives and he sets up his kingdom. They will from that time never ever again be another exile of the nation of Israel. That is that covenant of peace. Yahweh's people flee Babylon and return to Israel after the sword has come upon Babylon. Jeremiah chapter 50 verse 16. For fear of the oppressing sword, they shall turn every one to his people and they shall flee every one to his own land. You who have escaped the sword, go away. Stand not still. Remember the Lord afar off and let Jerusalem come to your mind. Let's look at the summary of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is the tribulation period. Gaza is forsaken in the day of the Lord. The land of Israel gets divided in the day of the Lord. This is a PLO state. Jerusalem gets divided as well. And that is making the capital of the PLO state East Jerusalem. There is a judgment of the nations for afflicting Israel. There will be the fall of Babylon. And Babylon falling is spiritual Babylon, financial Babylon, and the land of Babylon. And Judah and Ephraim will be returning to the land of Israel during the day of the Lord. Klausner explains in the Messianic Idea in Israel on page 84 that Zephaniah outlines that you are saved by repentance in the day of the Lord. As the day of the Lord is near, Zephaniah writes in chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, that it's a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of horn and alarm against the fortified cities and against the high towers. The high towers speaks of pride. Pride is a high tower. General destruction which looks out from it to all the earth. Special individuals will be saved in it. 
there is one possibility of being saved from it. That is through repentance. On page 85 of his book, Klausner explains from Zephaniah, the prophet calls out, Seek ye the Lord, all ye humble the earth, that hath executed his ordinance. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. It may be that you will be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. That is protected by him. Redemption is an act of mercy by the God of Israel for the purpose of sanctifying his name. In the Messianic Idea in Israel by Joseph Klausner, page 220, he writes, The redemption itself is but an act of mercy, that's undeserved favor, which the Lord will do for his people for the purpose or the reason of sanctifying his name. You see, when the land of Israel gets divided, it's bringing desecration to the name of the God of Israel because he promised with his own words that he would fulfill the promise made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when he promised their descendants a land. Redemption is the comfort of Zion. In the Messianic Idea in Israel by Joseph Klausner, page 220, referring to Psalm 102, he writes, The consolation of Zion is associated with the ingathering of the exiles. You will arise and have compassion upon Zion, for it is the time to be gracious unto her, for the appointed time has come. For your servant shall take pleasure in her stones and love her dust. So the nations will fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth your glory. When the Lord has built up Zion, he will appear in his glory. So it is when... The exiles of Israel are gathered is when Yeshua is going to return in his glory. Psalm 102, verse 13 and verse 16. You will arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor her. Yea, the set time has come. When the Lord builds up Zion, that is the ingathering of the exiles of Israel, he shall appear in his glory. When does that ingathering take place? During the time of Jacob's trouble. The exiles are redeemed by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And this is referred to in the book of Ezekiel as Klausner explains in his book, The Messianic Idea in Israel, on page 121, where he writes, commenting to and referring to Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 32 through 34, and that you say, we will be as the nations as the families of the countries to serve wood and stone. That's what the nation of Israel is saying today. We want to be like the nations. We want to join the world community. We can't be separated from it. So, as I live, says the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with fury poured out, will I be king over you and I will bring you out from the peoples and will gather you out of the countries where you are scattered with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with fury poured out. The ingathering of the exiles and the redemption themselves will be with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with fury poured out. These are the words that describe the way in which the God of Israel historically redeemed his people from Egypt. So in the Messianic Idea in Israel by Joseph Klausner, page 122, he goes on to explain and comment regarding Ezekiel in chapter 20, that in Ezekiel 20, verse 35, it speaks about the wilderness of the peoples. Here again, we have a parallel between the exodus from Egypt and the coming redemption, a parallel which we found in most of the prophets and which is to us a sign and a witness that the memory of the Egyptian exile and of the deliverance from it was the prime mover of the messianic idea. Like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness and the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, says the Lord God. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 36. In the time of the Egyptian exile, Israel was subjected to only one people. But in the time of the new exile, it will be scattered among many nations and be submitted to them. Thus, the wilderness of the land of Egypt is a parallel to the wilderness of the peoples. In the Torah anthology of the Book of the Twelve Prophets, volume 2, page 457, it explains from Zechariah chapter 13 that only a remnant of the exiles will be redeemed. The prophet speaks about the forthcoming great plague at the time of the final redemption. Zechariah chapter 13 verse 8 says that two-thirds will be cut off 
and will die, and one-third will be left or survive. Only the good will remain. One-third will survive. What is the summary of these things associated with the day of the Lord? You are saved by repentance in the day of the Lord. Redemption is an act of mercy by the God of Israel to sanctify his name. Redemption is showing mercy to Zion. Redemption is by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And only a remnant of the exiles are redeemed. Let's look at the distinction between the Messiah and the role and the function of the Messiah and the ideal of the Messianic age. And this is from Klausner's book, The Messianic Idea in Israel, page 9. Accordingly, a distinction must be made between the vague Messianic expectation and the more explicit belief in the Messiah. The definition of the Messianic expectation is the prophetic hope for the end of this age in which there will be political freedom, moral perfection, and earthly bliss for the people Israel in its own land and also for the entire human race. But the definition of belief in the Messiah is the prophetic hope for the end of this age in which a strong Redeemer, by His power and His Spirit, will bring complete redemption, political and spiritual, to the people Israel, and along with this, earthly bliss and moral perfection to the entire human race. This is known as the Messianic Era. In the Messianic Idea in Israel by Joseph Klosner on page 228, Commenting on Daniel chapter 2, he explains that the Messianic kingdom is a worldwide kingdom. Daniel chapter 2 verse 44 says, And in the days of those kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, but it will stand forever. The kingdom spoken of here is a worldwide Messianic kingdom kingdom. There will be peace and prosperity during the Messianic era. Klausner explains this in the Messianic Idea in Israel on page 239. The material prosperity after the redemption is portrayed in glowing colors by most of the prophets. Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Haggai, Zechariah, Joel. The elements of the material prosperity are peace among the nations, continuing on page 240 of Klausner's book, The Messianic Idea in Israel. The spiritual welfare which will accompany the redemption is also found in almost all the books of the prophets. The elements of the spiritual welfare are, number one, the knowledge of God for the spread of which at the end of the present age among all peoples and not just in Israel alone, hope most of the prophets from Isaiah onward. Number two, the doing of the good and the right, the love of justice and mercy, and almost all the prophets expressly or by implication. Number three, a new heart or a heart of flesh and a new spirit and a new covenant or the Torah written upon your heart. Number four, the perpetuity of the nation, the eternal existence of the nation of Israel and the perpetuity or the eternal existence of the Torah. Thus, the Messianic expectation of spiritual welfare includes the idea of human perfection and the perfection of humanity in the age to come or the Messianic era. This is going to conclude this teaching on the pattern of exile and redemption in the prophets. I pray that the message has been a rich blessing to you. Remember always these words from 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. He who says he abides in him, he who says he's a believer in Yeshua as the Messiah, ought himself so to walk even as he walked. And how did Yeshua walk? He kept the commandments of his Father, which means to follow the Torah. We likewise should do the same, even as Yeshua said in John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Shalom in Yeshua the Messiah. Amen.
Sereja 